The 70s weren't all union strife and economic crises. Over in a corner of the United Kingdom, a guerrilla civil war was raging, with the British themselves caught between the role of peacekeepers and belligerents. Since Thatcher entered Parliament in 1959, Northern Ireland had gone from a nuisance to a serious problem to a war zone, an open wound that no one could staunch. She took over as Prime Minister at the end of the bloodiest decade of the Troubles. She left office with the province marginally closer to a lasting peace, but mostly just increasingly exhausted, and in some cases speechless, but far from silent. There were those who thought that Thatcher's tough, uncompromisingly stubborn personality and her comfort in explicitly taking a side were exactly what the province needed. Most of them didn't live there. By 1979, the modern-day Troubles were at least a decade old, depending on where you start counting from. And his first decade was the most blood-soaked, with around 2,000 people killed before Thatcher even took charge. At the start of the 70s, Northern Ireland was run from Stormont, but the devolved government had long since disintegrated before Thatcher was even leader of the opposition. The province was now under Westminster control, by a Secretary of State. And Thatcher's choice for the role when she got in was Tory veteran and personal friend, Airy Neve. Neve had been part of the same monetarist ideological wave to which Keith Joseph, Edward Duquesne and of course Thatcher herself belonged. And when she turned out to be the one poised to carry the torch as leader, became her campaign manager. For his success, he was appointed unofficial chief of staff before being moved to shadow the Northern Ireland office. Previous secretaries, particularly the incumbent under Callaghan, Roy Mason, had advocated and pursued a policy of relative understatement, refusing to give the various terrorist organisations the status they demanded by referring to the Troubles as a security issue rather than a war, a matter for law enforcement rather than the military. Airy Neve was a veteran of the Royal Artillery, and even something of a World War II hero, having not only been imprisoned at Kulditz, but been one of the first to successfully escape from it. He was a military man down to his DNA, and he had a Northern Ireland policy to match. This was no mere security issue to him. The paramilitaries had declared war, and if that's what they wanted, then that's what they'd get. Under his watch, the policy goal would switch from merely containing them in Ulster itself, while the Royal Ulster Constabulary and Special Forces gradually picked them apart, to the launch of a full-scale military offensive, spearheaded by almost the entire SAS. The fact that this all-out war would be waged in the streets of what in theory was a British city didn't make any difference to Neve. He didn't start it, but he was determined to finish it even if the 80s had to be even bloodier than the 70s. And he wasn't shy about this policy either, loudly advocating it throughout Whitehall, even before getting the Shadow Cabinet gig. As you can imagine, this didn't exactly endear him to the Irish paramilitaries in question. Nevertheless, it was still something of a shock when, on the 30th of March 1979, two days after Callaghan lost his vote of confidence and with an inevitable Tory election victory within sight, Neve's car exploded in the car park of the Palace of Westminster. Neve was the first MP to be successfully assassinated since 1922, and the first to represent a British seat since 1882. In all three cases, and three more during Thatcher's premiership, the cause was the same, Irish Republicanism. Credit, because terrorists always claim credit rather than blame, was taken shortly afterwards by the INLA, a relatively new group roughly on the same side as the IRA, only with Marxism in place of Catholicism. Thatcher, in one of those rare moments that proved she was in fact human, 
was visibly devastated by Neve's assassination. Not to mention shocked. I and so many other people owe so much to him. And now, you must carry on for the things he fought for and not let the people who got him triumph. With the benefit of hindsight, it seems hopelessly naive, but it's true. No one realised the terrorists were prepared to go this far until they did. After which, of course, it seemed obvious far too late. Northern Ireland wasn't initially near the top of Thatcher's priorities for government. It lingered well behind inflation, crime, the unions and economic reform. But with Neve's death, it shot right up. A few months into her premiership, it happened again, this time to the Queen's cousin, and courtesy of the actual provisional IRA. Ireland certainly couldn't be ignored. Thatcher's intended strategy of just delegating the province to a military strongman died with the strongman. Neath's assassination could have led Thatcher to abandon his hardcore policy altogether, although knowing her, the more likely outcome would have been to double down on it. Ultimately, she fully committed to neither course. There's no way she was going to show anything resembling weakness. But equally, she wasn't about to give the terrorists the satisfaction of explicitly declaring war the way Neve wanted. They wanted to be soldiers. She wouldn't let them be anything more than common criminals. This distinction was at the heart of an ongoing dispute that had been rumbling on for a long time among the prisoners at the Long Kesh Detention Centre, a repurposed RAF airfield, initially full of Nissen huts. Until 1976, paramilitary convicts had special category status, which afforded them the de facto standing of prisoners of war. And in practice meant they didn't have to wear uniforms, didn't have to peel spuds, were segregated among the organisations they belonged to, and even had extra visitation of food parcel rights. All of this was grudgingly agreed to by the first Northern Ireland Secretary, our old friend Willie Whitelaw, in exchange for an IRA truce that lasted about 11 minutes in 1972. In 1976, the whole policy was scrapped. Any new troubles-related convicts would be treated as ordinary criminals in ordinary uniform, streamed together unsegregated in the newly built H-blocks of what had now become the Maze Prison on the Long Cash site. Naturally, this didn't go down too well. And almost immediately, a massive protest was organised, mostly among the IRA and allied groups that ran on for half a decade. They started out simply refusing to wear their uniforms, for which they had their visitation rights and then their furniture removed. In 1978, they tried a dirty protest, smearing shit all over the walls and floor until the whole H-block was crawling with maggots, making mere existence into even more of an unbearable ordeal than it already was for everyone involved. The government still wouldn't budge, so they transitioned quickly into a hunger strike, which began on the 1st of March with Bobby Sands' refusal to eat, and escalated from there into a full-blown humanitarian crisis. The hunger strikers were given a massive PR opportunity just five days in, when Fermanagh MP Frank McGuire dropped dead. Bobby Sands opportunistically dived in to stand as an independent candidate, and won much to the embarrassment of everyone not on the Republican side of the fence. But Thatcher, of course, was not someone who backed down when cornered. Rather, she'd rear up and attack all the harder. The humiliation of Bobby Sands' election and the concomitant worldwide publicity whirlwind that whipped up around the hunger strike just made her all the more determined not to give them what they wanted. Crime is crime is crime. It is not political, it is crime. And there can be no question of granting political status. I just hope that anyone who is on hunger strike for his own sake or think fit to come off hunger strike, that that is a matter for him. For every prisoner who wasted away and died, she just dug her blue heels in even further. Sands died after 66 days and was given a full military funeral by the IRA, attended by thousands. Thatcher didn't budge. They dragged on. By September, ten men had starved themselves to death and still neither side showed any signs of blinking. In a very real sense, Thatcher didn't care about these particular dying men. They were, as she said in so many words, criminals who had chosen to commit suicide. 
a choice she often pointed out that they didn't give the majority of their victims. She was absolutely prepared to let them all die if that was what they wanted so much. Eventually, the families of the remaining hunger strikers started to intervene, insisting on medical treatment no matter what the prisoners themselves said. Once it became clear that every hunger striker had lost the support of their families, the strike was called off. In return, the government granted slightly watered-down versions of most of their demands, without actually saying out loud that that was what they were doing, or that they were now political prisoners. Effectively, the strikers had won but Thatcher made that victory as pyrrhic as it could possibly be. She had also made herself, if she wasn't already, public enemy number one to the Republican forces. Previous governments hadn't really taken a side in these sectarian disputes so much as tried to stand above it, trying to calm the tensions altogether. But Thatcher, the full name of her party, the Conservative and Unionist Party, wasn't just a historical accident. Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom. She is part of the United Kingdom because that is the wish of the majority of her citizens. The majority wish to stay part of the United Kingdom. Northern Ireland was a part of the United Kingdom just as the Falkland Islands were and like them it was clearly going nowhere as long as Thatcher was around. This to the IRA suggested a logical course of action. The 1984 Conservative and Unionist Party Conference took place in October in Brighton in the historic Grand Hotel. In the wee hours of October 12th, a massive hole was blown in the front of said hotel with the intention of slaughtering the entire British cabinet wholesale. It was one of the most audacious operations the IRA ever did and would have easily claimed the number one spot if it had actually been successful. Not that it was exactly a failure, several people did die, but none of them were cabinet members, most were the largely blameless wives of minor delegates. Dozens, however, were injured, many seriously, including Norman Tebbit and his wife, the latter of whom was left permanently disabled. Thatcher, however, missed the blast by inches, with the hole in the hotel ultimately coming to an end right in the middle of her bathroom. She'd survived an assassination attempt. By this point, she seemed actually indestructible. However, and though she never let it show, she was shaken. Shaken enough to start talks with the Republic of Ireland and Taoiseach... Shaken enough to start talks with the Republic of Ireland and Taoiseach Garrett Fitzgerald about granting the Republic a greater say in matters related to the province. The 1985 Anglo-Irish Agreement that resulted established a calculatedly vague advisory role for the Republic against the Unionist instincts of Thatcher herself. The main thing she achieved, at least in the short term, by gritting her teeth and signing, was just to piss off the side in the conflict she agreed with, almost as much as she already had the other guys. And yet Mrs Thatcher tells us that that Republic must have some say... In our province, we say never, 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 never. Things arguably came to something of a head early in Thatcher's third term. <laughs> Remembrance Day atrocity in Northern Ireland. A bomb has killed 11 and injured more than 60. It was planted a few yards from the war memorial in Inniskillen. It went off without warning as the Remembrance crowds were gathering. The Inniskillen Remembrance Day bombing of the 8th of November 1987 has a special place among the atrocities of the Troubles as the one attack the IRA actually apologised for. Twelve people were killed, dozens more injured, almost all civilians, and civilians gathered to pay homage to the dead. It was an act so monstrous, it even horrified the perpetrators themselves. For once, the terrorists took blame instead of credit. 
They made a mistake, they said. They were aiming for the British soldiers due to march by a few minutes later. The timer was off. It went off too soon. They would never have deliberately targeted civilians, much less elderly civilians attending a ceremony of remembrance. For the first time in living memory, the IRA was sorry. It didn't wash. Most people accepted the point that the timer had gone wrong and they hadn't meant to kill civilians. But they still planted a bomb at a Remembrance Day ceremony with intent to take multiple lives. The IRA's precious Catholic and or Republican cause was dealt a blow from which it arguably never fully recovered. In the immediate aftermath, it was open season on Catholics among the Loyalist paramilitaries on the streets of Belfast and Derry. In the longer term, many of the IRA supporters shuddered and turned away, from the grassroots all the way up to their main arms supplier, one Muammar Gaddafi. Hard as it is to imagine him having any real moral objections to almost any act of violence. He did know his PR, however, and the IRA would now box off his poison. A more positive result was that everyone involved finally recoiled from the carnage and started making moves towards some kind of negotiated non-military solution of the kind Airy Neve was so uninterested in. The term peace process started to work its way into the narrative. Summits and talks started to happen, the sort of thing Thatcher usually equated with weakness and insisted she would never do under any circumstances, at least not in public. Negotiating with the IRA in secret when no one could see her and call her a big soppy wet girly coward was fine, as long as she still looked tough to the people. After Enniskillen, the appetite for the sort of macho posturing that got her so many plaudies during the hunger strike was definitely on the way. There was going to be a peace process and she was going to have to sit at the same table with the likes of Martin McGuinness and Jerry Adams both at the very least apologists for murder, if not murderers themselves, but both also making some kind of effort to show up and work for peace. Still, that didn't mean they had to be heard by the entire country. In October 1988, Thatcher and her Home Secretary Douglas Hurd announced one of the silliest pieces of legislation in British history. Jerry Adams called a hurried press conference to give him what he said was his last opportunity to speak on television and radio. But the words uttered by the MP for West Belfast this morning, and which were broadcast nationally at lunchtime, can no longer be heard as a result of the Home Secretary's speech. What Jerry Adams told the press conference was that the ban came as no surprise, but Sinn Féin would not take it lying down. No one involved with one of 11 Republican or Loyalist groups or organisations could have their voice broadcast on British television or radio by law. I say one of 11 groups or organisations, but in practice only Sinn Féin got the kind of press coverage to be affected. Heard thought this would put the broadcasting news on an equal footing propaganda-wise with the print media, presumably because you can't hear a newspaper. The Unionists will not have a veto over British government policy and that guns vetoes and injustices will all be left outside the door, then there's no good reason why talks cannot take place in an appropriate atmosphere. Thatcher, meanwhile, famously declared that the ban would deny the terrorists the oxygen of publicity. Inevitably, it had the exact opposite effect. More people knew who Jerry Adams was after he specifically was banned than they had before. The Streisand effect may not have been coined yet, but there was still such a thing as common sense. An initial outcry at the Orwellian nature of this legislation was quickly overcome by how ridiculous it was. From speaking to, uh, I'm, not, I'm not naming, but certain unionist individuals in yes. the North who have been speaking to Prince Charles. It seemed to have been drawn up and decided upon by Thatcher herself in the same half hour. 
and was reportedly forced on the media out of the blue with no warning at all and only the barest set of guidelines for what it all meant. After a few weeks of arranging subtitles and frantically editing archive footage until the government agreed that wasn't necessary, Someone tweaked that the ban was specifically on the voices of the individuals in question, not the words. And the ludicrous actor's voice era began. Providing gainful employment for various jobbing Northern Irish voice actors, future Oscar nominee Stephen Ray among them, to read out Jerry Adams' press statements, speeches, and occasionally read up entire interviews, which sometimes added a faintly surreal and dreamlike air of detachment to coverage of the peace process. When do we then see the guns handed in, the Semtex disposed of? Well, these are not matters for me uh, to be involved in. Sinn Féin doesn't have guns. Sinn Féin doesn't have Semtex. The British have the largest army in the field. The British have the most guns. The broadcast ban lasted for six years of increasing derision before finally being withdrawn in 1994 after the IRA's first ceasefire. It was the last trace of Thatcher's legacy in Northern Ireland. The province was the perfect proscenium for her obsession with strength. The best such she ever had other than the Falklands. The reason it comes in second is that the Falklands was a simple enough situation, a basic us and them, that the fist-waving macho attitude paid off, inasmuch as she won. The Troubles, however, could never be accused of being a simple situation. It required a bit more finesse and pragmatism, even occasionally compromise, things that Thatcher saw as synonymous, at least as far as the public was concerned, with weakness. Of course, she was smart enough to know that there weren't actually any such thing in reality, but she also knew the public image was what counted, and hers was hard, tough and uncompromising. Negotiation was contrary to her entire persona, so she would only do it in secret. Eight years after she left office, the new Labour government, spearheaded by Mo Molum, finally made the breakthrough in the form of a painstakingly negotiated peace settlement that ended the troubles as we think of them today. Thatcher reacted in public with disdain to the sight of Irish terrorist murderers flooding out of jail. But she was surely intelligent enough to know that the Good Friday Agreement probably couldn't have been reached without her own tooth-gritted signature of the Anglo-Irish Agreement against her own instincts in 1985. The cognitive dissonance must have been deafening. Pride at having laid at least a foundation stone for this piece, frustration at the fact that it had required a compromise with her own principles. One imagines self-congratulation eventually won out. It usually did. Oh, how I long to find some solace In my mind I curse the stream So farewell streets of sorrow and farewell your streets of pain no I'll not return to feel more sorrow nor to see more young men slain 